So what's the big deal? As we've already seen, the market is sensitive to, to this issue due to economic slowdowns from reduced demand due to panic and quarantines, as well as reduced supply from the same issues. In addition to that, there's the potential to trigger a recession, which generally reduces quality of life by invoking layoffs and suppressing wages. In an extreme scenario, civil unrest, riots, looting, and collapse of governments could occur due to unavailability of opportunity and overburdening of law enforcement. Now, panic is a natural human response, but unfortunately it's not appropriate for addressing the current issue nor for supporting the stability of a modern society. And panic can take a couple forms. It can take the form of economic panic, namely panic buying of essential resources, such as masks or apparently toilet paper, um, as well as panic avoidance of certain industries or vendors, such as restaurants and airlines and so forth. It can also take the form of political panic, where people tend to extreme ideologies, hoping that political extremism will somehow solve their issues. Don't be an idiot and don't panic because it doesn't help anybody. However, don't be complacent, carelessly catching and spreading the disease because that causes other people to panic more. Take this calmly, but take it seriously. In 1918, there was a flu pandemic that spread across the world it had a mortality rate of about 4%, so in the same ballpark as the current pandemic, with an R0 of about 1.5, a little bit lower than the current pandemic. It infected about half a billion people globally, and it killed about 20 million, which is more than double as many people who died in World War I. Despite the tragedy, it provided excellent data for us modern folks to navigate the current situation. During the 1918 flu pandemic, there was a stark contrast between how Philadelphia suffered and how St. Louis suffered. In September of 1918, Philadelphia hosted a rally to raise war bonds, and 200,000 people showed up on the streets to support their troops. One week later, 2,600 people had died. And very rapidly after that, because they didn't have enough manpower to deal with all of the people who were dying, bodies were being stacked and rotting in the streets. Many of them were buried in mass graves. The medical system was overwhelmed. Makeshift hospitals were built. Volunteers were recruited from community organizations and religious organizations, as well as from medical schools. And the life of the city had stopped. By contrast, St. Louis was not so reckless. They closed schools and public spaces, they staggered work shifts, they limited streetcar ridership, and they banned public gatherings of more than 20 people. And today, this is a practice that we call social distancing. As a result of those measures, their per capita death rate from the influenza pandemic was less than half of that of Philadelphia's, and it was spread out over a much longer time so that the pandemic wasn't so chaotic and it wasn't such a big emergency. Now currently in the United States, there are close to a million staffed hospital beds and their normal occupancy during non-pandemic situations is about 66%. When you do the math, that means there are 300,000 beds available. If 20% of patients of this new disease need hospitalization, then that means that we can support up to 1.6 million cases of the disease simultaneously. Uh, of course, assuming that we can transport patients to where those beds are, which is kind of a bad assumption. At the current rate with an R0 of two, that'll happen in a month and a half. After that, we're gonna need to build makeshift hospitals in order to have enough beds. Furthermore, in the US, there are about 62,000 mechanical ventilators and they receive utilization of about 50%. If 5% of patients of this new disease require ventilators, then we can support up to 620,000 cases simultaneously. At the current rate, that'll happen in 41 days. So after 41 days, we won't have enough ventilators 
to support the people who are sick and we're going to have to start making tough choices of who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. The consequences of overwhelming the medical system is that preventable deaths, things that could have been treated if only we had a ventilator, will turn into unpreventable deaths because we didn't have enough ventilators to go around. Once the medical system is overloaded, we're going to need to be selective of who receives mechanical ventilation. In other words, who do we give a chance to live and who don't we? In addition to deaths from this disease, other conditions like cancer, heart failure, gunshot wounds or whatever will also become more deadly because there won't be enough medical capacity to treat them. Our goal is to flatten the curve of how many actively infected patients there are. Reducing R0 both reduces and delays the peak demand, allowing sick patients to, rec to receive the care that they need, as well as buying time to increase the healthcare system's capacity. Even if R0 is reduced to 1.2, which is pretty respectable, the peak is 4.4 million meaning that after 11 months, which is when that peak happens, we'll need to increase how many hospital beds we have in the country by 50%, and we'll need to almost quadruple the number of mechanical ventilators in the country. At current capacity, assuming that we don't want to increase the number of ventilators in the country, we need to keep R0 less than 1.07. Ideally, we wanna bring R0 as close to zero as we can, so that this disease goes away as quickly as possible. Now there's also a consequence to doctors getting sick. Doctors and nurses are on the front line of treating this pandemic. If they become infected, it reduces the medical system's capacity and it'll cause more people to die. If you get infected, it's bad, yeah, but if they get infected, it's really bad. So hoarding medical supplies, especially respirators and surgical masks, limits their supply and increases their chances of becoming infected. Don't hoard medical supplies. Now a quick note I want to make about the data that's available to us. There's a lag time, about 11 days, between when someone contracts this disease and when they test positive. So it's a pretty safe assumption that the official count is not representative of how many people are currently infected, but instead how many people were infected 11 days ago. If the doubling interval is five days, then this means that there are actually 4.6 times more people who are infected than who have been diagnosed. So this applies to all of my previous analysis. Instead of 41 days that we have to exceed ventilator capacity in the country, we have 30 days. In addition to that, there's the issue of undercounting. So far, the United States has rolled out faulty tests and made it really difficult to get tested. Published numbers are not of the people who've actually, who actually have the disease, but the people who've been able to get the test and who tested positive. So it's very different. These numbers are very different. The number of people who actually are infected and the number of people who have tested positive. Some people have estimated that the number of infections in the US is 25 or 50 times higher than the official count. So instead of 2,200 infections, we have 25 or 50 times more than that, 50,000 or 100,000 infections. If that's true, then this reduces our time frame to overload the medical system down to 13 or 18 days. Here's a quick view of what that undercounting does to us. So if we assume that the number of infections is 25 times higher than the official count, then that means that even with an R0 value of 1.2, instead of having 11 months for the peak infections to occur, we only have about seven months. In the next video, we'll talk about the ways that the disease is spread.